everybody. Um, this is the first of our uh, workshops um, from the uh, eHealth Scientific Working Group for the UW um, Fred Hutch CIFAR for this uh, academic year. So we're very excited to be relaunching our um, workshop series. Um, today's workshop um, is really in response to uh, a lot of um, interest and uh, requests for support that we got from our CIFAR membership to provide um, some guidance, some um, discussion and opportunities to ask questions um, and discuss problems related to ethics in conducting e-health research. And so um, I think that the format of today's workshop is gonna be less teaching you what, what to do and more engaging in some discussions about what are some of the important ethical issues that arise um, in e-health and m-health research. Some of these are, I think, going to be quite unique to um, e-health as opposed to other types of, of research, but some of these really are um, going to be extensions of um, sort of ethical challenges or issues or problems that we face in all kinds of research and kind of thinking through how do we um, frame our e-health specific uh, questions in the context of, of um, ways that we've already solved this to conduct research. So I wanna uh, just introduce the speakers for today. Uh, I'm Brandon Guthrie. I'm one of the um, associate directors of the um, e-health scientific working group. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at uh, University of Washington in the departments of global health and epidemiology. Um, and my research focus uh, is really focuses around improving engagement in HIV care, primarily in, uh, in Kenya. Um, and I'll let our other speakers introduce themselves. I'm just gonna run down the list in the order that they are here on the page. So Keshet, do you wanna go next? Hi everyone, my name is Keshet Ronan. Uh, I use she and they pronouns. Um, I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Global Health. Um, and my research focuses on using mobile technology to support behavioral health in adolescents and women, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the US. All right, should I go? Go ahead. I'm having a little bit of internet trouble and I'm going to switch over to my uh, phone to do this. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Malia Fullerton. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm professor of bioethics and humanities um, here at the University of Washington. Um, I do work in research ethics primarily in the context of genetic and genomics research programs, um, although I, I think about research ethics problems in a variety of biomedical research contexts, including uh, my participation recently in a project that was focused on mobile health technology and thinking about uh, ethical, legal, and social implications, uh, which I'll be talking about today. Glad to be with you, all of you. Um, and my name is Emily Guthrie. Uh, I am uh, an anthropologist by training and um, I'm the Associate Director of the University of Washington, IRB, um, where I mainly oversee international research and work quite a bit helping researchers sort of navigate the changing landscape that is um, with any number of eth ethical issues domestically and internationally. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Great, thank you. And I think we've got a pretty large group on right now, and I don't think it's realistic to go through and uh, have everybody introduce themselves, but maybe um, for those who are comfortable and willing, maybe if you can just quickly turn on your video, um, wave hello, and so everybody can see who's here. <laughs> I see plenty of familiar faces, that's great. Oh, I see an IRB person. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> so. I'll start, I'm Joanne Steckler, I'm the director of the eHealth SWIG. I'm about to send a chat out to everybody about membership. Great, um, and Allison um, is one of our other associate directors. So why don't I have Allison say hello? Hi, I'm Allison Drake. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Global Health and as Brian said, also an assistant director for the eHealth working group. Great. Um, 
And maybe just so we can set some um, ground rules and norms for this session. So this is going to be, as I mentioned, uh, we do have some prepared content, uh, but we really want to make this as interactive as possible. So the, the speakers do um, are going to um, discuss some, some things, um, some targeted things, but we would love to have um, sort of questions from all of you. Um, I think using the chat is fine. Um, but also, if you if you want to be called on, um, we'll try to either monitor the chat or monitor the uh, raised hands. Um, from any of the speakers or from any of the audience, are there any um, issues in terms of sort of format that you would like to talk about? Great. Okay, so let me get back my presentation. Okay, is everybody able to see my slides okay? Great. Um, so just a little bit about the scope of the workshop. Um, we're going to focus on identifying what are some of the leading ethical questions regarding uh, e-health and um, m-health research with a particular focus on um, HIV and STI research, although it doesn't have to be strictly confined to that. Um, we're going to talk about some of the ethical principles that are relevant to um, e-health, including um, hopefully some lessons learned from other fields or other um, uh, disciplines in health research, particularly around genomic research, with the, the special interest in kind of examples where at the time that the research is being conducted, we don't have a full understanding of what all of the future implications for um, confidentiality, for identifiability, some other issues are. Um, and then we're going to have um, a presentation of some case study examples from eHealth and, and uh, mHealth applications, sort of uh, talking about how um, issues have arisen and how they've been addressed. And then there's going to be opportunity for discussion and questions. Um, Emily will be uh, sort of as our IRB representative here. If you have um, specific questions, you know, it's a great opportunity to get some feedback on those. We can't promise that we'll be able to answer all your questions or that you'll get the definitive answer here, but um, at least we can kind of start that discussion. Um, and at the end, I really wanted to, rather than presenting another case example, I'm going to uh, present the group with uh, a problem and want to work through, given some of the principles um, and issues that we've laid out initially, how we might address that. So um, our rough agenda here um, is kind of do some introductions. Um, and I wanted to open it up now for any specific questions or topics or problems that our participants are, are particularly interested in um, bringing up. And that will help us to kind of frame our discussion today. So go ahead and either put in the chat or um, feel free to raise your hand and we can call on you. I need to get the chat up for myself. So, I'm going to wait another couple seconds. It really is helpful if, if we get a sense of where all, where you all are at uh, in terms of sort of your approach mm -hmm. here, in terms of are you interested in um, sort of specific uh, questions or if you have, um, Okay, questions about verifying who is a minor or not um, in terms of consent. That's a great one. Um, I think Emily will be able to talk a bit about that. And Keshet and I have a, a little bit of experience about uh, working with minors in mHealth applications. Can an individual participate anonymously in research? Okay, great. Give it one more second here. All right, in the absence of any other 
specific questions. Let me turn things over to Malia. Um, okay, protecting confidentiality with phones and devices. Um, we are definitely gonna talk about that issue. Great. Security standards for data exchange. I think uh, we will address that as well. <laughs> Use of Chinese apps. Okay, I don't know um, if I have any expertise in that, but uh, we'll see what others think. And big data um, on Twitter and Facebook, dating apps. Uh, that is actually the prompt that I have for our last exercise. That's great. Emancipated minors. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and educating and informing participants about privacy of their data. That's definitely something that's going to work in here. Um, mandated reporting um, and suicidality. Okay, so I think there's some interesting. M health, e health uh, twists to that, but that's something that comes up in research, um, non e health research. So I think we can address that. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Malia, are you ready to go? I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, yeah. Let me let me get mine going here. All right. Uh, okay, I've got to get my people out of my way. All right. Uh, everyone can hear me and see my slides all right? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I don't know that much about your group. I know something about this topic, as I indicated, because of a project that I was recently involved with, which I'll spend some time on. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk generally about general ethical considerations for M health research. Um, and, and, but then I'll hopefully be able to chime in as we work through some of these very specific case examples and answer some of those really great questions that people were just putting into the chat box. Before I get going, um, I am trying really hard in my own personal practice to always begin uh, with land acknowledgement. This is text that I received from a from a colleague. Uh, just just a reminder to all of us. I think we all know this. I believe we're mostly local here in Seattle. You know that we are we are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples, people who are still here, um, and and we live and work in this space. And and we need to always be cognizant of that. I think as we move forward. Also, I think the events of this last summer have reminded us that we are in a country that would not exist without the free enslaved labor of Black people. Uh, so I want to honor and acknowledge the skills um, uh, that, were, that were, were brought as a consequence of that free enslaved labor, stolen due to violence and white supremacy. Uh, I, I take on the responsibility to continue to work towards justice and solidarity with Black and Indigenous people, and I encourage everyone participating today to take on that same responsibility. Thanks. So um, talking about addressing ELSI um, or ethical, legal, and social implications um, uh, in this world is an interesting one. It's an important problem. We are increasingly using mobile and electronic health devices uh, throughout. Uh, in our personal lives, as well as increasingly in a research space. Um, as a consequence of that, um, um, colleagues um, based uh, both here, uh, John Wilbanks, who's here with Sage Bio Networks here in Seattle, as well as Mark Rothstein at the University of Kentucky, um, got an R01 from the NCI that was specifically focused on addressing LC issues and the inter specifically the intersection of research using mobile devices uh, and unregulated health research. Now, I believe that mostly we're going to be talking about regulated health research today, but much of what I am thinking about and have, have thought about this issue comes from my involvement as a kind of a collaborator and a consultant in this project. Uh, and so I just, I wanted to note and acknowledge their, their work, which I think has been very instrumental in this, which is creating a kind of a space for thinking about ethical issues in this very broad and important area. Um, 
Actually, uh, Brandon, I think we were going to have some some definitions of, of M health or E health research, which I think dropped, unfortunately. Uh, but here's one more. Uh, this is the one that was actually the kind of a primary definition of M health research that we used throughout the Rothstein and Wilbanks project, uh, basically defining M health as the use of wearable and remote wireless sensors, mobile apps, and social media platforms, so very wide range, uh, for the purpose of observational research and or deploying interventions, often behavioral interventions, designed for health promotion and or, or, and or disease risk reduction. So it's a very, um, it's a very wide swath of activities uh, using a very broad array of tools, which is part of what makes kind of thinking about ethical issues in this space rather complicated. Um, we uh, engaged in a nearly three-year process as part of the, the Rothstein project, um, thinking about this intersection of unregulated research and, and, and mHealth research, um, which culminated in a series of papers. It was actually a really fascinating program. It culminated in a series of papers, which were published earlier this year in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Um, and the kind of capstone paper at the end of the issue um, was a con consolidated set of ethical recommendations uh, that I helped to participate in and about sort of 40 other investigators from around the United States um, in, uh, participated in. I'm giving you just the highlights here. And these are going to, I think, look familiar to any of us who participate in research because they are not that different from research ethics, basic research ethics principles um, as they apply in a wide variety of biomedical and health research context. The very first ethical recommendation was to minimize the risks and maximize the benefits of mHealth research, recognizing that risks can be quite varied in this space. They can include physical harms, dignitary and psychological harms, economic harms, and or societal harms. Um, and the best way um, in, in the course of the recommendations, the best way to kind of attend to those risks and minimize them as well as maximizing benefits is by pursuing a rigorous study design, um, working to transmit the least amount of identifiable or sensitive data. And this gets to some of those privacy and confidentiality issues that came up in the questions. Use stringent quality criteria when selecting results or advice to give back to participants in the context of an mHealth application and remind users that such apps are no substitute for appropriate individualized medical care. And then there was a primary um, recommendation to, even if it's not completely required in this, it, it is not required for some forms of unregulated research, uh, for investigators who are using these kinds of technologies to seek review by an individual or entity that is independent from the researcher and hence not invested in the outcome of the research. So that was the first primary ethical recommendation. The second was to obtain informed consent or permission um, as we are engaging individuals in the context of these kinds of technologies. Um, mobile platforms often that can facilitate research outside the bounds of traditional research institutions may fall outside regulatory oversight. That was a, an emphasis again of that project. But on balance, it was very strongly recommended that consent or permission should, should be attempted. And if it is sought, uh, the barriers related to the interaction of mobile devices and user, user comprehension should be addressed. It is all too easy, as I think we all know, to simply press, press accept and move forward. And so thinking creatively about the ways to actually let people understand what they're getting themselves into as they're engaging with a research and health application is incredibly important. Um, different approaches to informed consent or permission can be pursued from notification only approaches to broad consent, categorical tiered consent approaches. Um, that would be a whole much, much longer presentation to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches. Um, for those of you who are grappling with these issues, I strongly recommend kind of checking out the, the Rothstein article and the larger collection of articles in that journal issue. Uh, regardless of approach, key design principles include keeping language very simple, um, increasingly integrating visual elements, photos, drawings, um, and uh, Sage Bio Networks, I think, has been at kind of at the forefront of thinking about teach back approaches where we ask people to basically say back or give back or select back uh, responses to indicate that they've understood uh, what they're being told about participating in various forms of research. 
The third set of ethical recommendations involve protecting privacy and security. And these issues clearly came up in the questions that people uh, proposed at the beginning of our workshop today. Um, there is a, a positive obligation to protect individuals from the possibility that their personal information might be directly revealed, or as it's increasingly possible with big data approaches inferred uh, when data sets are published, shared, combined, or linked. This is a tall order. This is a very, very complicated problem. Um, and how researchers best do this, uh, whether they need to be working collaboratively with privacy offers, officers or others who can really assess privacy risks uh, and implement reasonable privacy and security measures is an open question. It's also an open question about to what degree the IRB needs to be directly involved. And I'm sure Emily will have thoughts on that point as we get there. Um, but it's something that uh, is no longer, I think, optional. Researchers need to be thinking actively about this in this space. Um, and a, a, a piece of uh, advice or argument that was made in the context of this paper, which I agree with, is it consistent with related regulatory approaches, such as what's implemented with the Health Insurance Portability uh, and Accountability Act, um, is, HIPAA, is a plan to notify participants when their data have been inappropriately accessed. Um, so it's not just a matter of uh, trying to ensure privacy and security, but to have a plan when it goes wrong, as inevitably I think it will, particularly in this context. Uh, in addition to those sort of three major buckets, and I promised I wouldn't go on too long, so just to, just to kind of kind of hit the highlights for the kind of a, another set of kind of subsidiary recommendations as part of this um, group's process uh, to consider heightened obligations, particularly if vulnerable populations are in play. Um, now that this is a big kind of ethically uh, complicated area, what, who con what constitutes a vulnerable population? We have some recommendations from regulations, but you know, particularly in a global health context, I think this gets more complicated. If vulnerable populations are in play, um, whether and how to implement additional safeguards, um, but to consider this as a part of routine research with M Health, as I've already indicated, a positive pro uh, proactive recommendation to pursue independent ethics review wherever possible as an external check, even in cases where the research may be formally unregulated or where there might be regula regulatory ambiguity as there is in this space, um, and really ensure responsible conduct and transparency. Um, this is the bread and butter, of course, of much biomedical research, but you know, really attending to appropriate study design, uh, data gathering and analysis. It's, I think a lot of what our kind of research ethics concerns in this space have to do with kind of that point of contact with the participant and how we're going to ping them or extract information from them, but equally important questions surround what we do with the data that are collected um, and how we uh, think about uh, using that data and continuing to learn from that data and making those data more broadly accessible in the context of various data sharing efforts. So um, that's a real whirlwind. It's very high level, I know, um, but I just wanted, this is what I, I, I was only supposed to speak for a few minutes. So this is what I mainly wanted to kind of leave you all with at the outset. And then we can come back to some more specific points. Again, an outgrowth of this really wonderful project that I had the privilege to participate in. And really for those of you who are interested in these or related issues, I cannot, uh, more strongly recommend uh, this basically special supplement issue that came out um, in the spring, um, which uh, you can get to through the University of Washington library system. We do, we do have a subscription um, and includes a whole range. I think there's something like 10 or 15 articles, including an article by myself and my colleague Shaniqua Collier, uh, thinking about uh, how, this, how these kinds of technologies should be employed with underrepresented minorities. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, those are the points that I wanted to share. I probably talked too fast, but uh, I think that there's lots of um, things we can talk about. And rather than just sitting here and listening to me talk at you, I'd much rather engage in conversation with all of you. So um, I will stop there. Great, Malia, that was perfect. Um, and I'm, I apologize for not having those definitions up. Um, let me actually pop those up right now. Let me 
a second. And while I'm doing that, um, if there are questions that anybody has um, directly for Malia at this point, we are going to get, I think, into um, a little more into the weeds um, and a great opportunity to tie back to some of those topics. But um, it would be great if anybody has um, burning questions now that we can um, either address now or put on the list of things to discuss in, in a little bit. Great, so these, um, these were the, the general definitions of e-health and m-health. And as you can see, these are really broad. Um, and so I think I'm guessing a lot of the folks here are thinking about um, m-health applications. A lot of us in, in the HIV world, I think are, are looking at m-health, but remembering that e-health um, is the much broader context of, of uh, sort of all um, electronic information communication technologies that are applied for um, promoting um, health and improving health. Okay. Yeah, and just to make the point that the definition that I showed, I think added the, the additional piece of uh, intervention, which I think is, is often how we're using these in a research context. Great. And any other comments from our, any, any of our panelists or participants? Okay, so up next, uh, we're gonna have Keshet talk about um, work that she's been involved with and hopefully provide some opportunities to sort of see some specific applications of the, the principles and topics that Malia was just talking about. Great, thank you. Can everybody see my screen? Thank you, Malia. That was um, very calming. Uh, I really enjoyed being given guidelines. Um, my presentation will be sort of the opposite, um, which is kind of a potpourri of um, questions that might make you feel anxious. Um, so, I'm going to talk about some um, experiences we've had in our work um, using IP messaging, internet protocol messaging, um, using platforms such as WhatsApp and Telegram for peer group interventions, and some of the unanticipated and perhaps anticipated challenges that we had with regards to phone sharing and confidentiality. Um, so how long do I have, Brendan? 15 minutes? I had scheduled, scheduled you for 15. I think we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. So okay, great. I think, don't Thanks. worry too much about time. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just start by kind of um, talking about some of the themes that I think come out of the experiences that I and collaborators have had in working in this space. Um, and then just give a couple of examples of kind of what I mean by them. Um, and then I hope we can just have um, a lot of discussion. So I think the, the, the first theme is that in environments where phone access or device access more broadly is contingent, access to privacy also becomes contingent. Um, and so I'll talk about some of those um, situations. Um, the second is that when we're delivering group-based interventions, which is an area that we've forayed into recently in the last few years, um, those really present unique challenges ethically in terms of privacy and confidentiality. Um, and then the third is that in this world where we're often trying to decide whether to develop new apps or to leverage existing apps um, and which existing apps to use, there are a lot of trade-offs in terms of practicality, in terms of ethical considerations, um, and those decisions become um, complicated. And then finally, as I was sort of thinking about this, I felt like often we find ourselves in situations where we're really torn between a few different considerations. One is usability and uptake. Um, you know, are our participants actually going to use the, uh, the app? Is the intervention that we're developing actually going to be effective? Will they have enough access to it? Another is equity. So when we're using these types of interventions, who are we leaving behind? Who are we excluding? Who are we putting at elevated risk? And then the third one is privacy, which I think has come up a lot. And I think that um, it's often hard to find kind of the optimal solution that is sort of at the middle of all of these and balances everything. 
Um, so I'll just give kind of an overview of the studies that I've been involved in in this space and that um, the experiences that I'll talk about come from. <clears throat> so the, the first are two um, related studies. Um, Vijana Smart was um, funded by the, by the UW CIFA, yay CIFA. Um, and this study um, was to design a virtual peer support group for youth living with HIV in Nairobi, Kenya between the ages of 14 and 24. Um, we used WhatsApp um, and the reason for that was that youth um, in Nairobi, youth living with HIV in Nairobi had previously been using WhatsApp for a very similar purpose, just organically. Um, and so we used the same approach. Um, this was a small study among 55 youth. We had two WhatsApp groups, each 20, one was 27 people, the other was 28 people and they were stratified by age. Um, we sent weekly study messages and then youth could kind of discuss however they wanted in an unstructured conversation. Um, and then there was a facilitator in the groups um, who answered questions, corrected any kind of misinformation, and then also addressed any conflicts um, or problematic behavior in the group. We did not provide any data bundles, so people just used their own um, funds to access, uh, access data. Um, this uh, pilot project led into an NIH funded R34 that Brandon and I co-lead um, in which we're sort of adapting this um, approach um, for youth who are transitioning from pediatric to adult care again um, in Kenya. Again, this is youth living with HIV. Um, in this study, um, we have hedged a little bit in terms of the app that we're using. Um, and are exploring both using WhatsApp and using Telegram, which is another very similar group messaging um, application. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the decision-making around that. Um, this is also a relatively small study, but bigger than Vigena Smart. We have four intervention sites with about 15 participants per um, messaging group, and then a very similar messaging approach. We send weekly messages and then this unstructured um, conversation. And then a couple of other studies just kind of for context. Um, before these peer group messaging um, studies, um, I was involved in a series of um, studies using one and two way um, SMS messaging, um, one of which was focused on improving ART adherence in peripartum women living with HIV. Um, this study was called the Mobile Watch X study. Um, in this study, so again, this is one to one messaging between a healthcare provider and the participant. Um, and we sent weekly study messages and participants who were randomized to the two-way arm could also respond and send messages back to the study. Um, this intervention was free, so the text messages were reverse billed. And then finally, a study that I'm working on now in the US, um, we are adapting an evidence-based um, intervention to prevent perinatal depression and providing it um, to youth in the US. And this is a group-based intervention and we're delivering it through um, through Slack. And again, no data bundles are being provided. So um, I think the first ethical challenge um, that I wanted to talk about was phone sharing. Um, and I think this is true particularly in Kenya, but I think it's also true in some contexts um, in high income countries. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, in Vijana Smart, 13% of the youth we enrolled um, uh, in 2018 um, had a phone but shared it. In Mobile Watch X, um, which was a little bit earlier, a couple of years earlier, and also not just in Nairobi, but also in other parts of Kenya, that proportion was actually higher. So about 30% of the women we enrolled um, shared their phone. So, you know, in thinking about what the implications of that are, um, obviously, if someone is sharing someone's phone and you're sending messages, um, there is um, potential, it's an anticipated risk that um, someone other than the study participant could access um, the study participants messages. Obviously, in the context of HIV or other stigmatized conditions, um, that presents a risk of status disclosure and potentially um, identifiability. Um, of the participant. So the protections that we put in place in, um, in uh, Mobile Watch X, so just focusing you know, on the simplest case where you have two people, the study and the participant, um, we explain the risk 
Um, and we refrained in our message and our outgoing messages from using um, overt HIV related language. So I think that's also an approach to reduce the risk that if someone found the communication that they could um, find out that the participant um, had HIV. So in Mobile Watch X, um, we developed a slightly more um, complex approach where we actually gave people um, the option to opt into more overt HIV related language if they had disclosed their status or had their own phone. So I think you can also think about um, some protections that are sort of responsive to the participant's individual situation. And then we also recommended that if participants felt concerned about this, that they could delete sensitive messages. But obviously, as a study, we didn't have control of that. Um, and I just wanted to share a, pri a privacy breach in Mobile Watch X, just so you kind of have a sense of the types of things that can happen in these contexts and the questions that they raise. So we had a participant who was enrolled in the study. Um, she was randomized to the intervention arm. She, at enrollment, reported a history of um, violence by her partner. Um, and during the study, her partner assaulted her. Um, and the participant reported that her relationship with her partner had deteriorated prior to study enrollment um, following her HIV status uh, disclosure and that he was um, stopping her from seeking HIV and antenatal care. She reported that the particular assault that happened um, during the study was after he learned that she was receiving antenatal care and had received a study text message. So obviously the study text message plays into a very complex situation. Um, and so I think, you know, this raises questions about um, is domestic violence a risk of the intervention? Is domestic violence a risk of participating in the study of seeking antenatal care? Like how does the study fit into this and what should we be doing about that? Um, and also how is this situation different? Is this an mHealth specific situation or is this really just an extension of um, you know, the risks of somebody finding out that somebody else is in a study by finding a consent form or, or other evidence that they're in a study. So that's kind of end of it, the, the simplest case. <clears throat> um, I think as we've moved into working with groups, I think the ethical implications are more complicated. Um, so again, access to intervention messages by a third party is an anticipated risk if you know that people in your study um, share their phone. The thing that becomes difficult is that um, that risk of HIV status disclosure and identifiability is now transferred not just from the participant who enrolled and consented and knows that they share their phone, but also to other participants in the group, right? Um, and that becomes a lot harder to control and explain. Um, so in Vijana Smart and Impact, some of the protections that we've put in place are again, to explain the risk, to say others in the group may share their phone or may lose their phone and someone may gain access to your communications. Um, the study can refrain from using overt HIV related language. Um, and we can recommend that participants ref refrain from using overt HIV related language. Um, as an aside, what we found is that that's very unnatural behavior. And so pretty quickly, when you have a group of people living with HIV, whose goal is to support each other and talk about things that are relevant, um, they use overt HIV related language. Um, again, we can recommend deleting sensitive messages. Um, and we can recommend installing a lock on an application such as WhatsApp. Um, which works if you're not sharing WhatsApp, but if by sharing your phone, you're also sharing WhatsApp, you have to basically give the code to the other person who is also using WhatsApp, right? So it has limited utility. Um, other recommendations to reduce the likelihood that your content would be linked to you as an individual um, is we can recommend not having um, your face as your profile picture or not using your name as your username. And then finally, we can explore whether there are other apps that provide better privacy protections. So um, I want to talk a, a little bit about specific privacy breaches that we had um, in Vijana Smart. So we had three situations where um, a third party gained access to um, a participant's phone. So the first participant, um, 
shared her phone or their phone with a caregiver. Um, both the caregiver and the sibling um, accessed the group. And we found out because the participant exited the group. And then when we asked them why they had exited, they reported that it, it was an accident and their sibling had exited them, right? So that's kind of how we found out that the sibling had gained access to the group. Um, they didn't communicate with anyone. Um, they probably just thought it was a strange group and deleted it. Um, the second participant did not report phone sharing at enrollment, but their sibling accessed the group and actually responded to another group member's message. And again, that's how we found out. Um, and then the third participant um, reported in an exit interview after completion of the study that at one point they had been having a one-to-one -one conversation. So not part of the intervention group, but a one-to-one -one conversation in WhatsApp with one of the other study participants. Um, and the other participant's wife um, started messaging um, because she was suspicious, you know, who was messaging her husband and why. So I think these situations present kind of uh, more complex problems about, um, you know, how could this be prevented and mitigated? What was, what was, there, was there harm? I think in all three of these cases, these were resolved with, with no harm, but what is the potential for harm? Um, can we kind of mitigate the harm that these types of events can do, knowing that we work in a context where phone sharing is common? And I think going back to sort of that triangle that I brought up, you know, we don't want to exclude people who share phones, right? That, that brings up an equity issue. We also, those also may be, you know, some of the more vulnerable people in our study population. And so we also don't want to um, differentially put those people at risk, right? So I think it just kind of brings up um, a lot of questions there. So then all of these issues actually prompted us to go to kind of the final point on the slide that I had a couple of slides go, which is, okay, well, are there other apps? Like, are there other technological solutions we could use that are lower risk? Um, so we explored those options. And um, as I mentioned, we explored, you know, WhatsApp, which was our original app and Telegram. So one of the reasons that we were interested in Telegram was that um, whereas in WhatsApp people's phone numbers are visible, which technically is identifiable. Um, Telegram only displays the phone number of, um, of people in a group if they are already one of your contacts. So um, you don't see the phone numbers of strangers, you only see kind of their avatar. Um, Telegram has built-in lock functionality, whereas with WhatsApp you would have to download a separate kind of lock. Telegram also has disappearing messages, though I haven't used them very much, so I can't comment on that. Um, one thing that I want to just raise um, that I'll talk about, I think, in a final slide um, is that WhatsApp and Telegram use their data differently. So WhatsApp is actually end-to-end -end encrypted. There's no server, whereas Telegram um, has client-to-server encryption, but the messages are actually stored on a server. So just kind of put a pin in that because I'll come back to it at the end. Um, both are owned, both are proprietary, both are owned by for-profit companies. And as we know, for-profit companies seek to make money out of the data that they own. And so it's hard to predict how um, the data they own will be used. And then finally, I think, <clears throat> and again, this is where the issue of access, equity, and um, ethics sort of coalesce. Um, WhatsApp is extremely ubiquitous in Kenya, whereas Telegram is much less ubiquitous. Um, and so that has both kind of pros and cons. Practically, it means that um, no additional app needed to be downloaded for WhatsApp. So that's really nice from an access and study implementation perspective. Um, but interestingly, what we heard from participants was that because of that, if you share your phone, you're probably sharing WhatsApp because most people who have a phone are using WhatsApp, right? Whereas Telegram, youth talked about Telegram potentially being kind of a dedicated private app for this particular group, which could protect better protect their privacy because the people who they shared their phone with wouldn't actually be using Telegram, right? So I think that was kind of an interesting twist that we didn't really expect. But as we've discovered, the ubiquity of WhatsApp is um, in large part because um, WhatsApp has entered a partnership with Safaricom where they receive um, where users receive free data when they top up their, their Safaricom airtime, they actually receive unlimited um, WhatsApp chat data for 24 hours. 
And so again, in a, in a, in a low income context where people's access to WhatsApp is very kind of contingent, um, this actually has become really important. And the fact that there is no free data with Telegram makes it actually much more difficult to use and presents real access and equity issues. So I think, um, you know, I, I think that while we were initially kind of excited about the fact that Telegram would provide additional protections because phone numbers weren't visible and because um, uh, Telegram could sort of be sequestered as this private thing, even in a shared phone, um, we're now finding that some of the access and feasibility issues are making that a really challenging um, thing to do. So again, kind of these different facets in which we have to think about these decisions become a little bit hard to juggle. Um, and then the final thing that I, that I wanted to, I think this is the final thing that I wanted to bring up that kind of goes back to that point I made about um, whether data lives on a server or not, um, is I think in any conversation about kind of privacy and confidentiality, I think that we need to kind of refine um, what we mean by that. And I think different people's privacy concerns are really different. And it's important when we do these studies to understand what, which aspect of privacy, confidentiality, and data security are our study participants interested in. So, you know, the first, which is I think mostly what I've focused on in, in, this, in these cases is concerns about individual disclosure and identifiability of personal information that could be used by individuals in your community, right? To discriminate against you. Um, I think there is an entire group of people who is much more interested in state surveillance, right? Um, you know, this is a, a poster that made the rounds on Twitter at the start of the uprisings this year um, that um, the data that is, the, the metadata that is collected about you as an activist um, is very dangerous, right? Um, and so people who are, um, who are surveilled by the state, who are targeted by the state, um, care about this a lot. And I think that um, it's important when we're thinking about, you know, criminalization of HIV, like this, this overlaps with health concerns, right? Um, and then finally, I think the other way that we can think about data is how data is used for profit and misinformation, right? And that's much more the kind of public conversation that's happening about data use in the US. And so when we go back to, you know, the comparison of WhatsApp and Telegram, um, many data security advocates um, say that Telegram is much less secure because every message you send is stored on a server that could be subpoenaed, that could be shared, right? Whereas um, WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. But for our use case, where participants were primarily concerned with their neighbor not finding out that they are in a group for people living with HIV, it's a very different calculation, right? So I think that's kind of an important um, thing to discuss. Um, and then I think, you know, one other thing, as we've talked about, um, you know, mobile, the platforms that we use in these interventions are extremely ubiquitous and we often deliberately target platforms that are very deliberate, uh, that are very ubiquitous. And so, um, you know, when we are talking to people about adding security protections to their WhatsApp use, um, this is everyday life. People are constantly making decisions about the privacy and the trust in these platforms. Um, so what is our responsibility as researchers or as providers in a health context? And how is that different from the decisions that we all make all the time to take risks in messaging people? Um, and then kind of going back to what we, um, some of um, Malia's um, recommendations, um, few of us truly understand the risks that go into these, even when we make, even when we click on the accept button of the terms and conditions for all the social media platforms we use. And none of us know how the risks will change over time. Um, and so how do we communicate that um, when we don't even know what we're communicating? So that's all I had and would love to just discuss some of these ideas with people. Great, thanks Kishet, that was perfect. Um, and one of the, one thing that I did also wanna just mention is that um, Kishet mentioned the kind of, that you had to download Telegram. That That has proven to be more of a challenge, I think, than even we recognize. So we're we're working with adolescents. So many of them have phones. While they have smartphones, they are older or fairly inexpensive, and as a result, may either be um, 
older operating system versions that um, have trouble downloading um, the newest apps, or they're just absolutely full and people just aren't uh, either aren't able or aren't willing to delete things from their phone to allow them to install Telegram. So, you know, depending on the group that you're working with, those those very, you know, technical and logistical issues become a real um, limiting factor that, you know, one, it's it's an issue in terms of getting enrollment, but it's also, it is this critical um, equity issue because already, um, you know, it, we're seeing that many youth don't have access to a smartphone. So that eliminates them from our, our pool of people who could get um, an intervention like this. And then to further limit that by, you know, restricting it just to people who are able to download um, an, an external app. And I think anybody thinking about app development, um, it's just a critically important issue that, um, you know, thinking, making sure that any app that you would even develop would, would work on a wide range of phones, potentially older phones or devices, and that people would be actually willing to, to download it. Kushet, anything you, else you wanted to add on that? No, Great. excited to chat to people about these issues. So maybe before we have Emily come on, are there any questions for Kachette or, or for Malia? Yeah, so um, Kachette, do you wanna address the uh, GDPR issue? I know we've already dealt with that a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question and I don't know. Um, so yeah, we haven't yet had to kind of work that into consents. Like if you want us to erase all your messages, you know, tell us. Um, and of course, if you're using a server-based uh, application, you know, like Telegram, like we, you know, we can't request that Telegram delete that data, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's a great question and I'm sure that that will kind of change what we're responsible for. Yeah, and if you are talking about, I mean, we ran into this. So if you're talking about developing any technology to be used with this, then the university is now really um, insisting that somebody sign, you know, documentation that they are they take responsibility for data breaches, which can be a huge barrier for software development. Um, Jessica, did you have any follow-ups on that? Um. I just, I think it's, uh, you know, particularly tricky when you get into the M health, you know, where, you know, and in, in other kinds of clinical research, you know, going back and, you know, expunging someone's data is a different story. I was wondering if there's ever been conversations with particular, um, maybe software developers who are supporting a lot of research platforms or who are interested in some of the kind of doing some social good with, you know, their platforms that they may, be considering ways to allow this or support this or just give more ownership of data back to users. So I don't have any solutions, but I'm certainly curious about it. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really important issue. And, and one of the outgrowths of the Rostein and Wilbanks project was to actually kind of talk to app developers about some of these issues. Um, now, whether that, that outreach actually changed any hearts and minds and how app developers who are on one side trying to make money from their products, um, how they are, might be willing to adapt or adjust their products to allow for some of these research uses. Right now, the, the, the tendency t is pushing more towards disclosure and basically saying once it's out there, your data is gone and we can't pull it back, as opposed to kind of doing things that we've traditionally been able to do in research, which is, is guarantee that we could expunge people's data. It's a complicated issue. Yeah, and you know, it's it's been it, it, moving out of um, like for-profit apps into like purely academic or intervention-based software development. It's a huge challenge because we barely have the budget to do like just the base software development, let alone all of the kind of high-end security protection and confidentiality stuff and. With Kishet and my limited interaction with 
um, computer science folks and human-centered de design folks here on the UW side, they there there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, getting up to up to speed with that. Emily, did you have any um, thoughts from the IRB side on this? Uh, the IRB is currently willfully non-compliant with G. We, we just we don't have answers as a university yet for how to even consider looking into it. Some of the clinical trials that have been reviewed by an outside IRB, like a private IRB, like Advara or WERB, have had to tackle with some of the language, but it's always kind of a mess because as Jessica's pointing out, you can't actually promise some of the things that are supposed to be promised. And so it is sort of a messy regulatory moment that I will fully acknowledge is uh, being allowed to stay messy at the moment. Any other questions or comments at this point? Okay, so Emily, my, do you want to? Oh, go ahead. Can I? Oh, can I just, Kashet, uh, uh, just sort of, if or Brandon, if you two sort of thinking about what's happened, and my Chinese comment, is, of course, refers to WeChat, which um, is a Chinese company that got uh, dinged by the U.S. government, um, and sort of how sort of those issues I wouldn't, you know, would never have previously thought that my research might be Im impacted by sort of politics. But um, mm. my comment in the chat is just that tel Telegram is Russian, which, you know, is only a step away from the Chinese government. And, and have those thoughts played into any of your decision making? We've certainly talked about it. Um, you know, the degree to which it is, you know, accessible by the Russian government or, a, you know, an agent of the, you know, Russian state, I think is, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and to Kashet's point, our, um, our participant population is much more concerned with the individual level confidentiality than they are with some, you know, unnamed, unfaced, um, you know, state having access to the data stored on the server, that doesn't necessarily mean, it certainly doesn't mean it's not a concern. Um, I mean, we have, we have done this balancing act between um, sort of the calculus that, that some of the data protections that Telegram offers provides a better combination of features than, than WhatsApp for our group. Although as we are finding, practically implementing that is proving to be challenging. Yeah, I, th I think, I think Joanne, I, I totally agree with you. And I would say that um, like Facebook's privacy record is abysmal, right? So I, I, I don't think like I wouldn't, uh, you know, single out WeChat or Telegram. I think that they, they all present uh, real problems. Um, and again, I think that yeah, I'll echo what Brandon said. I think we're a little we're a little stuck between you know what are the concerns of the participants and how do we address those? Um, what can we do, um, and what is feasible? So like Signal, you know, I don't know if anyone uses Signal, but Signal is sort of the one like open source uh, messaging, secure encrypted messaging platform. Um, but uh, it actually doesn't address the privacy challenges that WhatsApp has in terms of seeing people's phone numbers. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's sort of a question and it would be, again, it would be another app for people to, to download and we would have some of the same access issues that Telegram has. So I think it's all imperfect. And I, I do agree that I think talking to app developers ends up being important and just highlighting that, you know, these are our concerns. Um, Hey, Facebook, can you do better? Um, and just kind of yeah. asking those questions. And, and you, bring up, you bring up an interesting... Go ahead. Interesting point that, you know, the, our, our participants may have some concerns, but, you know, there are... You can't see me making hand gestures, but the broader concerns and from an ethics standpoint, which are primary or are they equal? Right in terms of what the concerns should be in terms of where the risks are. Right. 
Exactly. And I think this is something that I, I am hoping that Emily is going to address a little bit. So there are the there are the concerns that a participant has today, um, and there are things that you think that they maybe should be concerned about, either because of risks today or in the future, and the degree to which, you know, it's the researcher's responsibility to take into consideration hypothetical risks that the participant actually, at least at this time, isn't even concerned about. Um, you know, back to, to WhatsApp, the, you know, while it is an, an encrypted in which at least theoretically means that nobody can intercept or, or read those messages, um, my understanding is that the traffic, the metadata is still um, accessible, right? So they still would, you know, you can see who's communicating with who. Kishet, is that true? Yeah, I mean, Facebook, Facebook owns WhatsApp and they don't do it for fun, right? They make money off of it. And I, I don't understand how, but I can only imagine, but that's because I don't understand these things. But c clearly there is value, there's monetary value in who is sending messages to who. And so, yeah. And I think, again, it is owned by a company who might change their policies at any moment. Um, yeah, and as, you know, as um, surveillance uh, agencies have shown, they're actually oftentimes more interested in the metadata than they are in the actual content of the messages. So, great. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, so I, promise we will have a little bit of a break, but why don't we, Emily, do you want to um, sure. take, take over from here? Yes. So I can see why I was positioned here at the end. Um, okay. So I have some slides. I'm not going to project them yet because now I just have some things I, I want to say. <laughs> um, and then um, if my slides end up helping me, I'll, I'll project them. But Yes, so the IRB, I often get asked for answers, I'm not going to really have any, um, but the IRB, my job is really to take sort of the theoretical underpinnings like Malia was talking about and translate them into practice, this sort of theory to reality type thing, which is a very moving target for most of the things that we are talking about. Um, this hypothetical you know, one of the things I, I sort of glib about is that every IRB protocol we approve is a hypothetical. So it hasn't happened yet. We don't know what the reasonably foreseeable risks are. We think we know. We have a question in the IRB protocol saying, you know, what are the unforeseeable risks? And we get a lot of sarcastic answers. But the reason we ask that is to say, is there, you know, do you have while we talk about reasonably foreseeable risks, do you have some things that maybe we should think about? And sometimes it's cleaner to think about this with a drug study, like, okay, here's a drug, we've given it to animals, here are some things we think about, it might have these other problems. Um, and then over time, as they start to have more patients take the drug, they report back to the IRB about it, unanticipated effects, it gets added to the consent form, um, and sort of that's how the iterative process works. You know, Mobile technology or implementation science or anything that's sort of new and coming around is actually sort of same thing, different technology. But all the different pieces can be different. And I think one of the things that Malia actually said this when she and I were talking earlier that I've really thought about a lot since, which is while that's true, we often think in the IRB world about the magnitude and probability of risk. Generally speaking, it's that one person taking the drug or the other people sitting in the focus group meeting. What is really an issue, I think, in e-health and m-health technologies is the fact that the magnitude of the risk could be much larger because the data could simply get to a place where you it's bigger than you can even really know, essentially. Um, so I'm just looking through my notes here to make sure I cover what I want to cover. Cachette talked about the definition of minimal risk and what is minimal risk. And she very rightly pointed out that it has to do with that encountered in daily life. And the, the risks encountered in daily life shift. And they have shifted since I've even started working at the IRB. 
Um, when I started working there 10 years ago, everything that involved Facebook went to the full board because we didn't understand it. Then everything involving Facebook started to go into just sort of everyday life, everybody is using it. Um, no way that it needs to go to the convened IRB. And now we're entering a time where we're considering sending some of these studies back to the full IRB because of the magnitude and probability of harm involved in some of these mobile technologies because we simply don't know. Um, and I think that that shows how this can change over time. And honestly, we're all, I think, just trying to do the best we can. I can share my screen now. And I see some questions that are sort of IRB specific that I can get to at the end, but um, pardon me as I try to figure out how to share my screen. Okay, is that doing what I need it to do? So if these, uh, I just wrote down these sort of three key issues, they, they uh, follow on well with Malias because they are based on the same ethical framework, which, which makes it sort of hopefully convenient for all. Um, this translation exercise, people have all been talking about it. I think it's one of the biggest issues we deal with domestically too, by the way, not just um, in some of the global health contexts, which is, you know, how do you convey information to individuals in, in plain language? We all say we have to use plain language, but sometimes that can actually be an impossible exercise. I mean, some of the things I talk about is like, would my mom understand what it is she's being asked to do with her smartphone that I have to download all the apps on? Um, you know, how do you communicate that to someone? The um, common rule, the new common rule, the, the regulations that oversee uh, research with human subjects now requires that consent language be tailored to the population that they are being used in. That was sort of always implied, but it's now a requirement. So sometimes we will ask you in the course of a review, you know, what research have you done to make sure that this particular group you plan to work with, that this is the information that they will want, that this is what they will consider important. Somebody was asking about the risks that the participant is concerned about versus the risk that the um, researcher is hypothetically aware of. That's where you get into sort of, I wouldn't say that there's one that wins, but I would say that, you know, we are charged with making sure that the participant understands the reasonably foreseeable risks, reasonably being, yes, a movable target, but at every any point in time, we have an idea of what the reasonably foreseeable risks are and conveying them to people in a way that they can understand. And this can often be, this can often require a tremendous amount of homework because the amount of reading of fine language of like what's apps when you sign the thing, we all have to read that now and really figure out what it is, work with the AG's office to understand what the university's liability is. What is it really that we are saying yes to? What type of data really could be shared? Um, and that can be an exhaustive exercise, but is part of the burden on the researcher, I think, for doing this type of research to be able to really communicate to potential subjects what it is that could be going on. Um, and this gets at one of my sort of trite but true comments about IRB work, which is don't lie. So in our um, consent form, our standard consent form template, there's a confidentiality section. And there's the first line says something along the lines of, you think I'd have it memorized, but I don't. It says something along the lines of, your information will be kept confidential. I have now started having teams remove that line because it's not true. In this day and age, there are different certain types of studies where that's actually a false statement. Um, it's not a requirement, we could talk about this, but it's not a requirement that you keep the data super duper confidential. You can have a study where you say, I'm gonna share this on the internet completely, you know, but it's getting to this sort of joke about don't lie to sometimes have that in there by reflex when actually the ball has sort of moved away from the time when we were able to keep someone's participation in a study confidential. Um, sorry, I'm just having all my notes. So that's the consent part. Um, 
And then the benefits versus the risk. So this sort of maximizing benefits, minimizing risks is one of Malia's first slides. And I smiled because I thought, yeah, it's on my slide too. Um, the main sort of the or question being, is the benefit of the risk of this research worth the risk as we understand them at this point in time? Um, I think about this too, this is sort of conflating two ethical principles at once, but you can forgive me, of language barriers, not just literacy, um, tech literacy, but actual language barriers and high risk research. And we've sometimes have had panic phone calls from people saying, oh, I have this subject and they speak X language, we don't have any materials, you know, how can I get them in my study? And the answer is, you can't enroll them in your study. You're not going to be able to because you aren't going to be able to facilitate complete understanding of the study to somebody if there's no way you can communicate with them. Even if um, we usually get this for sort of rare diseases or things like that, where you're desperate for any subject that comes along. So even if there would be sort of a tremendous amount of benefit, there's a lot you're taking on by having somebody come into the study for whom you can't communicate or fully communicate or make sure they understand the whole thing or understand what the risks are for the study. Um, so I think we talk about that with sort of with languages, but I think tech literacy, there's a moment to talk about there where at what point is somebody so unaware of what's going on with different levels of risk that participating in the study might not be a good idea. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is um, will the benefits and burdens of this whatever M health practice you're looking at be distributed fairly? Um, this, there was a story in KUOW on Friday last week, I think, maybe Monday this week, looking at SCAN, the Seattle flu study, um, and talking about how really, to quote the headline, SCAN only tests white rich people in North Seattle. I'll say for the record, that's slightly unfair. They are trying very hard, but the point is, they are running into, and I encourage people to go read the article. Um, they are running into this problem of parts of the city people are very comfortable with going online and ordering the test and getting their test online. And in other parts of the city, basically no one's logging on and doing that. So they are in the end getting kind of this disproportionate representation of what's going on based on all of these things people have talked about. Um, either literacy or access to online capabilities. I mean, it's one thing that we're dealing with with all the schools in Seattle being at home where there's lots of struggles with people having online access at home to even do their schoolwork. Um, and that's right here in Seattle, let alone in some of these countries that we're talking about. So looking at sort of this equity or justice issue of who is incurring the risk of research and then who could, who could benefit from this particular technology. Those are my sort of big overview points about the things that we talked about. My next slide is actually a nitty gritty slide, Brandon, about um, e-consent and REDCap, which I know a lot of people have questions on, but uh, I didn't know if now was the time to go into that. Yeah, let maybe pause here. Um, Keshet, Malia, did you have any comments or questions for Emily? Shet talks to me already about all her data breaches. Uh, and any any uh, audience members want to ask questions at this point? Well, I, I'm I'm just I'm, while we're waiting for other questions to to queue up. Uh, I mean, I just, I think that that second bullet point, Emily, you know, is the benefit of the research worth the risk? I mean, I think we had some really excellent examples and discussion from Kishet and Brandon about, you know, risks are in the eyes of the beholder, right? And different populations mm -hmm. see yeah. risk differently. And benef benefits too, right? I mean, which just makes this extraordinarily complicated. And what might seem beneficial from the point of view of the research community, from the scientific community, um, 
might not always land that way. And certainly the, the balance may not look the same. Uh, and, and that's going to vary tremendously by context. And I think that's what makes this really, really complicated. And uh, as, someone my, as, as someone who does not uh, intersect with a lot of global health research, right? So I only have a vague concept of what this looks like on the ground in other countries. Um, I just think it's particularly challenging, and then and then you add the differential of a kind of a a, a Western-led research team, right, into the mix, and it becomes mm -hmm. complicated. Right? I, and I would absolutely, I mean, as a researcher, you're always biased, right? You think that your intervention is going to be tremendously beneficial, and um, you know, maybe you're overly optimistic or maybe your definition of a benefit or a successful outcome is not all that important. Even if you achieve it, it's not all that important to your participants. Um, and I think one of, in terms of the scale piece, I think magnitude of risk, uh, we talked about a little bit about this in our planning meeting that, you know, with, with um, drug trials, there is this very um, sort of titrated approach to expose as few people as possible to risk before you really know the full scope of risk. So the phase one, two, three version of, of clinical trials is really intended to prevent you know, exposure of, of large numbers of people and people who are probably at, at potentially at the highest risk of having negative outcomes. You know, This kind of research is not subject to that. And I think that um, eHealth and mHealth research, because it is actually so amenable to, to scale up, um, I think it is really important to keep in mind the, you know, at, before you scale something up really big, to really have a, a clear sense of what the, the risk and benefits are. And I, I think that I can definitely speak for, for myself, and I think Kachette would also echo this, is that, you know, we we were limited to doing these relatively small pilots driven more by funding, I think, than by like our aspirations. But it's been incredibly helpful to do a pilot because it it brought up things that weren't even really in, uh, we weren't really even anticipating them as being issues. Um, and so some things end up not being an issue at all, and that's great. And other things that you didn't really even anticipate show up. So I think to the degree that you can slow yourself down a little bit and you know run some pilot trials um, to learn some of these lessons, or at least talk to other people who have done comparable pilots and learn from them, I, I, I can't really recommend that enough. Brandon, I wonder if um, having some language around very common issues related to e-health and research would be helpful. I mean, I think about someone who's entering this for the first time and wants to do an intervention with a mobile health or e-health um, application or use it in some way in research are, are really poised to do that or have really thought through. I mean, obviously like this workshop is an example of like kind of thinking through some of those, but it has changed so much over the years that um, even just having some examples of like, how do you describe this in your consent form? Um, how did you explain the risks? What are the risks? And just sort of documenting that. And maybe that's a place where the working group um, could develop a website that, again, it probably won't, um, it will get scale over time, but I think it would be a, a valuable resource for people to see, you know, the types of things to think through when you're considering trying a new project, particularly for people who are new to the field. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, partly because, you know, mobile health and, and e-health is, is kind of hip and popular right now, but also because it is so, I mean, you can you could spin up a, you know an M Health intervention with very little resources. You know you can just run it from a individual phone and get people um, participating. And as Emily alluded to, you can even do remote um, consent and enrollment. So like the um, you could get into this with very little background or um, expertise. So I think yeah. that's a great. And I think that the, you know, I'm sure, Emily, the number of like questions you've had about like remote consent with COVID mm -hmm. are like, you probably get at least one a week, if not multiple a week, just asking about that. And there has been so much more done in that um, area in the last year. So even that specific topic, having some examples would probably be helpful for people, even beyond the, you know, CIFAR community. Um, it could be a place where the IRB maybe even can say, we have approved this, you know, check out this example if you want to see, 
you know, some examples of researchers who have used remote consent um, and have been approved. Maybe it's even a link on their website. I don't know if you want to go that far, but at least in those consultations that the IRB has with researchers um, to say, here's a place you could look if you want to see more. Because you guys already have them. I guess if, if I could just add to um, um, first, just you know, to thank to all of you for your presentations and comments and just um, very much relate to Emily's comments, you know, coming also from an IRB um, world and the global health arena. And I think one of the things that um, Emily alluded to with that flu study was the importance and the need for getting out into those populations that it's um, in addition, I think, to the access and technology familiarity, it's the trust or lack mm -hmm. thereof in research. And, you know, certainly different populations having different levels of, you know, different histories with research and different levels of trust. And so I think part of the potential distribution of, you know, something that factors into the potential, um, you know, who gets the benefits and the burdens of the research, you know, certainly the benefits are going to be distributed if that sample is more representative and, you know, obviously is speaking, um, has participants from, you know, a wide, you know, multiple populations. And so obviously that's what the flu study is now, I think, you know, alluded to in that, um, in that piece that they need more outreach in those communities to engage a broader population. But I think just kind of following on and Brandon, your comments have kind of the homework that's needed, I think that's a big piece of building those into the research, you know, um, into proposals and studies of kind of having that ability to be in those communities where the research, where you're targeting populations and mm -hmm. have, you know, folks of those communities, you know, on the research teams, et cetera. So I think that obviously that takes some time as well. And I mean, I, I feel, beholden in some ways to the Seattle flu study with whom I'm, I've been working very closely for the last year to say, you know, I feel for them because this is something very easy to say and hard to do because they have had people in clinics and in sort of refugee centers and they've hired people who speak, I believe we're up to like 27 languages that work on the team and go out into communities and work in churches. And I mean, they, and it's still proving to be so difficult. And so in some ways, I'm looking at the, the flu study as like an implementation science study, like they're all helping us figure out like how to do some of these things. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that we don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good either. And that, you know, sometimes we're just trying to do the, the best that we can. They're in a challenging position and a very public one. So Great. So I want to make sure that we stay on time here. And I thought, you know, it, it would be good, Emily, if you could talk just a little bit about the um, online consent and that kind of thing. And then I thought after that, we could take a, a quick five minute break. So if you're not interested in hearing uh, about e-consent, you can take a break now. Um, but I think if we can talk about this for maybe just like three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Okay. I mean, I figured it'd be something that people were interested in in this particular group. Allison's right. It's come up repeatedly um, over the last couple of months, um, mainly because in Washington state, we had a big issue. So this is a global health community. So I think primarily, so um, it wasn't such an issue overseas, but here in Washington state, red cap did not qualify for documented consent. And so when we had people in isolation who could not be approached, REDCap could not be used to get remote signatures. So we really struggled with how to make that work. And when I'm not being recorded, we can talk about how we solved it. So, um, but because that became such an issue, our office and the AG's office and um, ITHS have been working to figure out how can we make it compliant with Washington state law. And so on the back end, things you never see on the back end that has been sort of worked out. And so starting October 15th, REDCap can be used for documented consent in Washington state and also for documented HIPAA authorization for those of you working um, domestically. 
it is still an issue, even when um, in another location, that when you are using REDCap, and this is primarily for a more than minimal risk study, so if somebody has a specific question about this, I'll answer that, but um, when you need documented consent, it has to be applicable with local law as well. It's my understanding that in Kenya, um, REDCap is appropriate for documented consent, but that is something to work out. For those of you, if there are any of you, there are a few, even in the global health um, arena, just by some of your names, I know some of you, <laughs> who are doing FDA regulated research, which has different rules for documented consent and different rules for things like part 11 compliance, really fun regulatory stuff. You can use REDCap, but there are other things you're going to have to do on the back end to make it fully compliant. So we have a big push coming out about this because this has been such a big question. So you'll get um, an e-news form from us on the 15th talking about this. But since I get so many questions about it, I thought I'd bring it up here. It should be easy, but it's not. Yeah, and I would say, you know, it's, I think that the lessons that we've learned about sort of doing e-consent and online enrollment are things that I imagine that people even after COVID is long gone, people will think about as, as an opportunity, um, which I think is great. Um, but I would say, you know, we've encountered a number of just logistical issues that have nothing to do actually with the, technically the documentation of consent. I mean, just getting people to, um, you know, one, how do you find them? So the ref whole referral process um, is yet more complicated. Um, if you are working with minors, it gets, you know, like having a, you know, a guardian or parent um, and making sure that they are in fact who they say they are, just um, confirming the identity of the participant um, is, is obviously more complicated in this, in this context. And, you know, we could do a whole probably workshop um, on that, but I think if people are interested in it, it would be great to kind of develop some resources um, in the working group around that as well. Kishet, do you want to add anything? Okay. So let's go ahead and take uh, about a five minute break. Um, we'll keep the, the meeting open. I think it would probably be best if you just um, stay logged in uh, and we will reconvene at about 11.30. If people are still on, I wanted to ask one question. Samantha Dolan asked methodologies from HCD, UCD, and I have to admit, I don't know what that is. I can talk about that. I would, yeah, I was gonna, maybe when we come back from the break, was gonna talk about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, and I, I also know. wonder, um, uh, Navina, I hate Human-centered design, is that what that yes. could mean? Yeah, ah. yeah. Um, Navina, I think you're on the call and I hate to call on you, but if you have thoughts about that, I think it would be great to hear from you. Navina is a PhD student in computer science and might have some insights. Oh, okay, perfect. Can I just clarify that it's 11.30 now? So 11.35, is that what Thank you're you. aiming 11 for? 11.35 is what I yep. meant. No worries. Mm, okay, she posted the scan study. Um, we did not even detect the issue that Kashet mentioned of the, um, the fact that WhatsApp um, has this deal with Safaricom where they, you can get free um, unlimited messaging for 24 hours if you just top up your phone and it can be a very minimal amount. And the thing that we're identifying is that it's, it's not actually probably the cost of the Telegram messaging itself. It's that the fact that a lot of the, the youth are just, ne they're never putting enough data on their phone to update their phone fully. And so when they, when they put um, 
data bundles on the phone, it almost immediately gets sucked up by all the stuff that the phone is doing to update and send old messages and download old messages. Um, and so it, it's that's still an issue that we have to crack in terms of like, if we're gonna switch to Telegram um, with, with our population, it, we're probably gonna have to do something as far as like providing them with an opportunity to do the downloading or give them data bundles or something. But um, I think that's, it, there's, there's some that but definitely, I think with the HCD stuff you can detect, but realistically, some of these, especially some of the ethics issues only are gonna um, emerge as you sort of roll it out in a, in a larger scale. Anybody else wanna comment on that? Navina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, really what, what Brandon said was uh, what I was going to say, just that, you know, that is a central tenet of human-centered design, I think, that you can anticipate everything and that use is emergent in um, the, the process of using technology. So um, maybe it's a matter of, you know, checking in more often in terms of ethics, like having that as a, a central thing that's constantly being evaluated over the course of a study. Um. Navita, do you have any advice? I mean, we definitely probed on sort of privacy and confidentiality as much as we could, but are there any other approaches that you would recommend to get a fuller, um, you know, engagement on that upfront to try to, you know, to anticipate as many of those things as possible? One thing that comes to mind is uh, value sensitive design, um, which kind of probes into what do people benefit from? What do they see as the benefits of the study versus the risks of privacy and kind of making that like a very uh, in-depth discussion as opposed to, you know, something that, it, that they decide and kind of think about at the moment of signing a consent form. Um, and then another is just, I mean, there's a lot of work on privacy out there in human computer interaction and uh, on privacy in the global south. And, you know, for example, this idea of using a, a new app or like something that people aren't used to, like Telegram, even that can have potential consequences just based on prior work, right? Like seeing something unusual on someone's phone and um, then you might open it. So maybe, you know, what's the knowledge that's out there can provide a sense of some of the risks. Um, Yeah, and one other comment that I would add is that um, it is like to to do these types of to conduct these types of interviews with someone about their attitudes towards privacy requires like very skilled facilitation, I think, and an enormous amount of um, preparation and thought in designing the guide. Um, I think that, you know, reading some of the transcripts from, from our interviews, um, you know, you really have to like set up the situation and kind of create it and have people walk through what it would feel like and what might happen. I think that most people um, are not spending a lot of time thinking about potential risks but and can very easily imagine them and report them to you. But I think when you just ask about privacy, that's not a connection that uh, our participants were necessarily making immediately. Yeah, I, I that does not surprise me a bit. <laughs> and I mean, and this is, I mean, this is the case in the United States. I mean, you sort of ask people generically about privacy, particularly yeah. in the context of these applications and social media platforms that are ubiquitous that we all use all the time. Uh, I have been shocked, shocked by talking to my students who who have no idea where those little clicks are going. <laughs> and when you start talking to them about, about it, um, actually, you know, one of the questions that came up earlier was the whole issue of suicidality. Uh, and I just, I wonder if anybody was gonna talk about that because, you know, there's a whole bunch of M health research now going on that's trying to predict, do predictive analytics. And mm -hmm. it's very, very concerning to me. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, young folks are just not really clear on how much the, the choices they're making uh, add up to yeah. very important information about themselves that they may, may not even realize about themselves. Let's, let's talk about that. Emily, 
Yeah. Hold on a second. I think, Kashet, can you talk about the example from Vagina Smart, and then we can we can talk. Maybe Emily can chime in. Sure. We've had a uh, we. I guess we had a, we had one case in in Vijana Smart in Kenya, and then in the study in the U.S. that we're um, starting now, we have some kind of procedures around because since it's focused on young peripartum youth um, who are at risk of depression. Um, I mean, I think that our approach has been very kind of old school. It immediately gets referred to in person and it's the a human is immediately in the loop. Um, so I think it, it, it moves to like a phone triage and referral to in-person resources, which actually in the Imagine study that I didn't talk about very much, but the, the US-based study, um, we're recruiting people all over the US. And so we're also trying to um, refer them to local resources and it gets quite complicated. Um, but yeah, there's like a whole sort of triaging of, um, you know, do, do, you, do you have the means? If you're suicidal, do you have the means? Do you have a plan? Are you an immediate risk? Do we need to send an ambulance? You know, um, yeah. And in Vijana Smart, I think where it was in Kenya, where the resources are very, very limited, um, Again, it was a very involved process where the facilitator had sort of conversations with the participant and referred them to in-person care and followed up and did they seek in-person care? And um, it definitely felt imperfect, but I think it was as imperfect as identifying suicidality in any study. And I think maybe the one thing that I would add is that, um, I mean, I think, you know, we did anticipate that it was certainly something that could emerge. Um, I don't know if we thought that it was as likely as it sort of turned out to be. And I think one thing, just anybody doing um, something in this arena, I think as we all know, people share way more in social media settings than they typically do outside of those settings. And I think that you, if you're doing something at all like this, especially with, um, groups that may be at a little bit higher risk of um, severe depression, clinical depression, or, or suicidality, it is likely that you will probably see some of this stuff emerging. And so it, it needs to be, I would say you need to anticipate that rather than just kind of cross your fingers and hope it doesn't happen. Um, Emily, do you want to talk? I completely agree with, with those things that you are saying, as I often say with great, you know, risk comes great responsibility. I think in those studies, when you know who people are, it is important to follow up with them if you have asked questions that elicit that. What the IRB is currently struggling with is research that's much larger groups of people than you're talking about based on anonymous responses online. And then they're asking questions to elicit, you know, mental health states in general and sort of all sorts of other things over time and they are getting responses that are indicating that somebody might be at risk but there is in fact no way to contact them because you don't know who all the people are in your study and so that's sort of falling into this group of like well then it gets back to what I was saying in the beginning benefits versus risk and you know just asking about suicidality doesn't necessarily bring on suicidality but now you have this piece of information what what is it worth it to ask those questions? Is it really important for your scientific question? I mean, there's sort of no there there if you can't do anything with this data point. So that's, I think, where, especially in an M Health, where you can get a tremendous amount of aggregate data very quickly, what do you do with this particular piece of information? Same thing, you know, a lot of these things come up in genetics research too, like down the road later, you find out some nugget of information. You're like, okay, well, do I go back and tell everybody who submitted data to this? Yeah. And one thing I would say just that even if you, even if your M health um, intervention really has nothing to do with mental health directly or probing on suicidality, there is a good chance that it will emerge organically. Um, and so I think, like I say, even if you're not probing on it, I think it's something that you, you do need to take seriously. Um, one of the thoughts that I had, I know this, um, this happened on that, that group is that be, especially if you're working with, um, peer groups, you have to think also potentially about the impact that discussions about depression or suicidality by somebody else in the group, unprompted by the moderator 
has on the other group members and the work that they may need to feel that they need to do to help that person along. And that's, that's really challenging. I think that then it's like a second order level of things. Not are you, not only are you having to respond to the index person, you're actually potentially having to support everybody else um, that's exposed. And I feel like it's worth mentioning, as you pointed out about people being very open on social media, one of the things that I've been surprised with is how many other things are happening that people are reporting via study responses, sexual harassment by their boss, for example, or things like this, where, you know, and reporting it to the IRB, we can just help you figure out what to do, by the way, in those situations. But that's another sort of surprising aspect of the sort of faux anonymity that a lot of these studies feel. And so you end up getting people sharing a lot more than you anticipate. And that presents challenges because once you call them, they actually don't want to talk to you. So once you call them to say like, well, I can refer you to in-person care, they say, I just wanted to get it off my chest and I want to talk to people anonymously. I actually don't want to go see, you know, a healthcare provider, which is stigmatized. So. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and we can take this a couple of different ways. I had a, a little exercise that I had queued up where I thought that I'm gonna could present a problem or a, a, a research opportunity, um, and we could talk through some of the um, you know implications or things to think through. But I'm I'm happy to pivot and just open it up for a broader discussion. And I know that we've got some people leaving here. We're a pretty small group, so I wondered if there were other themes that people wanted to cover. Yeah, I think that would be great. I, I'd love to hear from everybody or as many people as want to talk. I think our group has dwindled a bit. Um, I can also just call on people. In my class, I have the best success calling on people and asking them to talk. Can, can I jump in? Sorry, I know that's probably not what you want. No, sure. <laughs> But I'm just curious, I mean, um, I can't remember, maybe Emily, it was you who alluded to it, this whole, the, 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 the problems around e-consent and making sure that the people who are consenting are the people that you actually think they are. So the whole kind of, I'll call it the catfishing <laughs> phenomenon mm -hmm. right, in this space. Um, and I will confess that I don't recall us talking about that very much in this work group that I was a member of. And uh it seems like almost an impossible to solve issue, but, but how is it being solved? Uh, well, I often comment when I get, so it's piggybacking on an FDA requirement that you figure out, you have to get you know verification that the person who is signing the consent form is the actual person. So you do all this sort of, all these contortions when someone was in isolation with COVID, where they would take a picture of their, you know, their authorized representative would take a picture of the driver's license and send it. As much as that is an issue, we don't ever ask, I don't know of it, a situation where we ask if people are signing a consent form in person that they present their ID. Um, so I always think it's a bit funny that actually for this, we um, have started to make such a big deal of it, of it, but it has to do with a lot of the laws in the local places. Jessica's hopped off, but uh, she asked about, you know, verification of minors and how old minors are. And I think that's another interesting question because it's sort of something, for lack of a better way of saying it, we never used to ask before. <laughs> it was just like, oh, this is a kid. Okay, you told me you're a kid, great. Um, you know, you told me you're not a kid. I think for some more sensitive studies, perhaps we look for verification that they're over 18 or 17 or wherever the age may be. Um, but yeah, this is sort of brand new territory where we are sort of figuring out how do we know that people are who they say they are. And after Cachette, wasn't it one of your studies where the person picked up the phone, it may have been somebody else's study, picked up the phone and said they were the study subject, but they really weren't? 
Uh, I've heard of that. I don't think it yeah, was one of our studies, like, but yeah. How can you, in a world where that happens, what can you possibly do, you know? I mean, one, we, in the end, didn't end up implementing this because things opened up in Kenya to a degree that we could do in-person enrollment, but we did put all the pieces in place to do it. And the, the Kenyan ERC actually was requiring a fairly complicated like set of hoops to jump through to document that the person was who they were and they would have to jump on a, a video call. We would ask them some, you know, not necessarily get a picture of their ID, but we would ask them some questions about their um, participation at the care clinic that would confirm that they actually maybe not are who they are, but at least that they're getting care at that clinic, um, mm -hmm. which we figured was good enough because those they would be eligible for participation regardless if, if they met that criteria. And, and they actually were asking us to record that um, for and maintain it in our records. Like I said, I'm glad that we never actually had to do that because, you know, it opened up a whole new sort of set of data that we had to keep protected. And um, I mean, it, it was gonna be challenging to do. So I think if you're, you know, even going forward outside of COVID, there's a lot of advantages of online enrollment, but I think that the logistics, especially in some place like Kenya, where you can't guarantee that everybody's gonna be able to hop on Zoom, um, is, is going to be a little bit challenging to implement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Any other questions or comments? We just got our first application to use TikTok. <laughs> Good timing. Risky. Good timing. Yeah. Who knows if it will exist and how? <laughs> I know. I, and I thought of this group actually, because I was like, well, I don't know what to do with that. Emily, rather than me talking through that, um, that example, could you talk a little bit just about publicly available data um, for recruitment or for intervention. I'm thinking particularly about Grindr, but I think that, again, I know, I know we can't get into the nitty gritty details in five minutes, but I, that's something I think would be helpful to hear. Okay. Is the data from Grindr publicly available? My understanding, and Joanne, if you're still on, I, my understanding is that it is. Yeah, um, so it, it the Chinese have done very limited um, things to try and protect it. So what happened a few years ago is that it got scraped. You have to, I mean, it's not publicly available. You can't Google it. But if you are a capable programmer that you can uh, do it. And there was a um, group that dragged it, created a, a fake website that included all of the grinder data um, and made things more public than they were. And my understanding, at least as of a year ago, is that it is while Grindr sued this other fake company that the loophole that you can still scrape the data is still open. Okay. So I would say that there is currently a sort of black hole between sort of regulated and unregulated research, and this is where it is. So our office reviews research with human subjects. If it's publicly, if it's publicly available or readily available, um, or if it's non-identifiable, we don't review it. And right now, there are lots of things that fall into this hole that the you know we say, okay, well, it's not it's not readily identifiable. We've said no to reviewing it, and then over time, things in this category are becoming more and more identifiable or there are more and more sophisticated people that can figure out what I watched on Netflix and bought on Amazon and then choose I looked at once and like put it all together and figure out exactly who I am and everything about me. Um, that also, those types, like Joanne was saying, that type of sophistication um, is still actually an unregulated space where um, 
the regulations, what they say is that it has to be readily identifiable to the investigator doing the research. So if it's readily identifiable to you or your advisor can give you the code or sort of sort of quaint, antiquated ideas like that, we would consider that to be readily identifiable. And if you can't readily identify it, then no. We don't always know people's sophistication. And if the team behind that particular grinder project came to our office, we would say, you have a different definition of readily identifiable um, than everybody else. So I would say in my last minute here that this is where there is an actual ethical issue that's outside of the regulations, which I rarely try to discuss, which is if somebody came to me with that data and said they wouldn't have to, I'd point out, if it wasn't readily identifiable to the investigator, I might not know about the study. But if somebody came to me with the data and said, I wanna do a secondary analysis on this, we might have an issue where we go back to the definition of privacy, which is that people had an expectation, whether or not it happened, the data was gathered under the expectation that it would not be shared. And therefore it would be a violation of that expectation to allow people to do further research with the data. Now Malia can talk about this more than me, but we have seen a little bit of, she's looking at her, she's like, I know what you're gonna say. Uh, we, <laughs> there is some of this starting to happen with genetic research and being submitted to genetic databases where even if it's de-identified, if the data comes from a source in which subjects did not consent to having their data shared in that way. Even though technically the IRB doesn't have authority over the research use of that data, they are not allowed to be submitted to the database because it's a violation of respect for persons. Very much simplifying genetic data sharing, but I think that's a place where these sort of data, large data projects might end up going a place like that, where a lot of the genetic research has gone, where we've had to deal with different definitions of identifiable and looking more at sort of what did people expect when they participated in this study or went online now. Yeah, and we don't have time to even. It's <laughs> <laughs> a huge issue with people who are engaging in direct-to-consumer genetic testing and then putting their right. very detailed genetic information into public, publicly accessible spaces and then crying foul when, mm -hmm. of course, law enforcement starts accessing it and or researchers. Yeah, it's right. a very complicated issue. Well, with that, I think we will wrap <laughs> this workshop up. Um, hopefully this kind of whetted everybody's appetite, um, maybe uh, um, allayed concerns in some areas, maybe highlighted some concerns in areas that you weren't even thinking about. And, and I think that was actually kind of part of the point of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, please let us know if there are topics. We'd love to do something like this again in the future. Um, and sort of the more, feedback we get, the more that we can tailor the, the materials that we present um, for what our audience's needs are. So thank you all. Thank you to our presenters and panelists. And with that, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.